Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Josh X. Now Josh is someone whose opinion I respect on a number of topics, diet, fitness, spirituality, how he sees the world, like his outlook on the world. And for me, it's the combination of those factors that really resonate with me. And I just think it's so valuable that he shares his message and his journey and all of his knowledge, experience and wisdom with you guys. And obviously I'm curious myself so yeah, um, if you wouldn't mind, Josh, I appreciate you've already introduced yourself on like various different podcasts and things, but would you just be able to give like a quick intro, just your journey and your current like fitness journey as well? Because I think I'm really fascinated in how you've built this amount of muscle mass on like a fruit-based diet. So yeah, just a quick intro and then your fitness journey, please. So I'd say I became very aware around about the age of eight or nine. I started to observe my life and make changes to what didn't make sense to me. And this went on for many, many years. So my diet was the first thing I started to change. I took myself off milk and chocolate and sugar as I grew into a young, say, 10, 9 or 10, um, which then this huge thirst for knowledge started to develop. And I'd say... From the ages of about 16 to 26, 7, maybe 28, I really needed to make sense of the world. Uh, so I went into every conspiracy, every diet, what, the, what information was within the world, specifically at that time, before there was a lot of... Um, Disinformation, a lot of censorship. It was like prior to that, which led me to develop a resentful, hurtful space within inside of me and a strong desire to change the world. Mm. And of course, through my searchings, I was looking for a sense of liberation, a sense of freedom, a sense of joy and happiness, because ultimately I thought the more knowledge I acquired, the more freedom I would find. And one of the things that I feel is fundamental is to never stay fixated or boxed inside a certain concept. So I was continually peeing through. And I'd say at the age of 28, I discovered that the issue, or all issues, were inside of myself and it was the way I was perceiving the world to be. Mm -hmm. And all of the ancient mystic knowledge from philosophy to alchemy, spirituality, Freemasons, everything that I was interested in, was a, a mystified version of the truth within. For example, the chakra systems and the energy that isn't free flowing is blocked by our illusion. And our illusions are our thought processes, our fears, our anxieties, the depression, pride, resentment, all of these negative energies. So I delve deep into a contemplation for possibly about two to three years. So each moment I live life as a contemplation. Because for me, meditation is not a practice, it's a state. And it's a state when you become free from mind. So you're very balanced. And um, prior to this, I always endured a fitness journey, which I should have mentioned from the age of about 12 years old. So I faked my age to join a gym, which mm -hmm. was allowing 14 year olds in uh, to start my journey at 12. And that went all the way through until I was 28. And at 28, 29 is when I moved away to nature. And I built a fruit garden, disconnected from the matrix. And allowed my consciousness to really just expand during that time. For seven years, I lived a very nomadic, free lifestyle. Which was perfectly aligned with my experience at the time. But it's okay to be happy and free when you're not involved in the matrix. Mm. But the real challenge is to be absolutely free, no matter where you are in the world, doing absolutely anything. So I brought myself back and I re-engaged in a fitness journey. And fitness isn't just for the physical aspects of the way you look, but it's for longevity, it's for mobility, it's for the connective tissue strength. The joint strength, bone density strength, 
Um, so as a part of my lifestyle, my routine now, I've reunited with that fitness journey and I've incorporated it into this higher conscious, elevated food system. Um, and it's not something that you need to stay away from when you're on the spiritual journey. It's, it's something that can be embraced because the idea is that you shouldn't be doing this is also a concept that blocks you from your freedom, essentially. Mm. Yeah, that's that's just on that last point. That's something that's really hit home with me recently because I was active for most of my life. Then I had a period without fitness and things like that. And now I'm getting back into it. And, and like you say, it's a, it's a component of health and life. And it is so important for longevity and just overall well-being and things like that. But just just quickly, I don't want to go too off track. What's your current uh, like height and weight? Obviously, your height's staying um, the same. But yeah, <laughs> and like where were you? Because you've had quite a rapid transformation. Yeah. I think my, my height, I'm not sure in centimeters. I'm, I'm a five foot 11 and a quarter, which is about 182, three, I think mm -hmm. it's maybe around that sort of area. And my height, depending on, you know, a few factors, just making sure I get the right amount of meals in each day is, is ranged in between 235 and 240 pounds, which is around 16 stone 10 ish mm -hmm. around that sort of area. Yeah. yeah. Maybe 107 kilograms. Wow. And where were you maybe at the start of your journey? Was that like two years ago or your recent journey? The, the recent fitness journey? Yeah. Um, it, it came off a very extended period of fasting. Uh, yeah. So I was obviously very, very small. No no fitness. I went down to around about 145 pounds, I'd say. About 140, 145. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's rapid. And that was, sorry, how long ago did you say that was? It was around about two years ago that it began again. Yeah, yeah, so that's rapid. Now, obviously, like as a caveat, like you did have some muscle memory uh, from prior training, but still, I don't, I'm not sure if people really appreciate like the magnitude of that feat. Like, it's it's no easy task, and I'm sure it takes a lot of dedication. And I've I've got like a, a viewer question. He asked, um, put it somewhere on screen here. Yeah, he said like, how do you build size when eating high fruit, raw vegan? or not even just raw vegan, let's just say high fruit, because obviously the label. Um, and for someone who needs to eat so much all the time to maintain weight, how does he keep this up? So I guess if I was to rephrase that, what's like a typical day of eating and training for you? Well, first of all, we just touched that question slightly. Yeah. When you're eating fruit, it's so easily assimilated and digestible mm -hmm. that you really need to be increasing your volume. If you're not making any type of gains it's just down to the fact that you aren't consuming enough so whenever you reach a plateau you have to push an extra meal in and like i've always said if you look at the largest animals on earth they tend to be plant-based you know the rhinos the elephants yeah. gorillas giraffes and it's it's down to the sheer volume i think what we do is we fill ourselves up in the stomach with so much water content that we feel full and possibly satiated um but really our body needs so much more nutrition to build a bigger physique now a bigger physique is not necessarily something which is for everyone um it's very difficult to maintain the body does not want to really have excess muscle mass because then it has to produce more blood more oxygen which is it's not detrimental, but it's not for peak um, longevity, we could say. But as for an experience, to experience what it's like to be very strong, um, it was always something when I was younger which very much appealed to me. And that would have been, of course, due to programming. My father was very strong, very masculine. So we had a very masculine energy in our house. And because of my prior engagement in the gym, and when I say 12 years that I was 28, I was training on Christmas Day. I was training every single day, I ate five or six times a day for 14 years straight. Mm -hmm. And I dedicated each moment of my life to the art of bodybuilding, which separates many people. Now, training is one thing, and obviously nutrition is the other. Training is probably about 20 to 30% of the, the work, the rest is nutrition. But 
when people train, trying to acquire a level of hypertrophy, which is where we're increasing the size of the muscle cells, um, you really need to be able to take yourself away from the body pain. Mm. Um, so you're kind of disengaging from the pain that you're feeling in the present moment when you're lifting these weights because you have to go through so many mental barriers to be able to lift uh, that amount of weight for that amount of repetitions. So it's not just you go in the gym, you just lift a few weights, eat a lot of meals. It's a combination of both. So that's very important. And then back to the original question that you presented. Yeah, as soon as I book. wake, oh, yes. as soon as I open my eyes, at this moment in my experience, because again, I said it's not for longevity, this is just for the experience. I consume maybe five, six or seven bananas straight away. Mm -hmm. Because I've been sleeping, my body is slightly depleted in its glycogen stores. And for muscle growth, the fundamental fuel is going to be glycogen or the sugars. Mm -hmm. And then without those, you get very depleted and you don't have the ability to build or maintain the muscle that you're looking for. And that's one of the big misconceptions within the world and the fitness industry is you need protein and there's not as much emphasis on the carbohydrates fruit itself as a fuel is perfectly combined with amino acids and the sugars which we're looking for which create the protein synthesis which builds the muscle tissue which allows it to grow but again like i said it needs to be very very high in volume and prior to this journey i was strictly fruit based but since this journey because i live in the uk it's very difficult to get fruits that ripen especially during the winter, maybe bananas and apples, you'll be good. Oranges as well. But anything other than that, maybe grapes, nothing ripens. So I had to incorporate some other foods just to maintain the size and also increase the size. After that, I would have 100 grams of organic, gluten-free, pure oats, they're called. And in the UK, if you get gluten-free, they're not organic. Or if you get organic, they're not gluten-free. Even though oats by nature are gluten-free, it's the processes that they've gone through that makes gluten appear in the, in the oats himself. And I would have approximately 80 grams of honey with that. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at protein, just for example, in 100 grams of oats, there's actually 16 grams of protein, which is quite high for what people would yeah. think, you know, is, is um, a non-protein meal. There's protein in your potatoes, there's protein in your rice, there's protein in your bananas, there's protein in everything. But like I said, it's the amino acids which we need. And then as soon as I finished that, I would be having a smoothie with a punnet of strawberries, maybe three or four frozen bananas, and a handful of grapes. Mm -hmm. And then I would begin to make my lunch <laughs> as soon as I finished the smoothie. And that lunch could be say six to seven hundred grams of potato and I would make a type of curry or chili non carne to go with that and I would use a certain legume which I never had legumes prior to this um, but I would use chickpea green lentils uh, kidney beans some of that and I would make this fresh obviously and try and keep that raw so I would use three tomatoes with coriander, a small amount of honey, a little bit of lemon juice, some salt. I would blend this up. If it was going to be the chili con carne, I would probably grind up some cumin, put that in just to give it that flavor. And I would obviously warm or have the, the beans made. You have to do them in abundance because they take so long to, to prepare. Mm. And um, yeah, warm that up and have that with the potatoes. And every two hours, I would have a meal similar construct to this. So it would either be sweet potato, squash, but squash isn't really very high or in dense calories because it's also mm. a fruit. So I need to kind of maintain a very high calorific intake throughout the day. And it would switch from maybe rice with a, a lentil curry or a coconut curry with chickpea all up until maybe 10 o'clock in the evening. And then my last meal in the evening would be just strictly fruit-based as well, just for the easy assimilation, uh, which mm. would probably be 
six bananas, a handful of grapes, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, that sort of thing. In the region of about 4,000 to 4,700 calories. Wow. Yeah, thanks for that insight. That was very like in depth, and I think I think a lot of people will appreciate that because I'm quite I'm quite a logical guy. <laughs> I'm trying to tap more into the creative side and just yeah. But I think it is quite nice to actually know the the, the ins and outs and the, the details. And for you personally, what have you observed like in your body since going from like the high fruit like fruitarian whatever you want to call it to like this newfound way? What kind of changes have you observed? Uh, you can see a subcutaneous like layer of water, mm. which you find when you watch someone who goes from like a meat based diet to a plant based diet, they lose like a, a small amount of cellular water. You can see it around their face and neck. Mm. And then if they remove themselves from processed foods again, again, and it keeps coming down to a very thin skin. I just noticed that with the amount of bulk that I put on and the food shift, yeah, just a slight bit of water retention. Mm. Um, and the more they eat, the more hungry you get. Yeah. If you miss meals, you begin to lose your hunger. So it's really about keeping it on point throughout the day so you can continue to eat the amount you need. Uh, apart from that, obviously muscle size, maybe oxygen requirements are slightly different than they used to be. Mm -hmm. So my fitness might be a bit different. Um, but I, ch I, I try to get my cardio with my my weightlifting routine. So I don't tend to have much rest in between sets. I keep it quite high paced. Mm -hmm. um, Cause running when you're this way, is not going to be good for your ankles or knees or longevity for that. So I just tend to stick to those basic foundations, weightlifting and stretching, um, which is good for the mobility and maintaining mm. that. Mm. And I'm curious, once you, is there like a point you wish to like reach? And then once you reach, if there is, if, if you reach this point, will you like go for another experience? Like, would you want to be this kind of size for a while? Or is it just purely a demonstration of like a, a lower protein diet and like a high fruit diet? Yeah. Initially it was to be able to show the community and communities that is possible for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in bringing it back, it made me realize how, how nice it is to have that extra cushion on the body. So, you're not bumping your bone yeah. on the wall. Um, so I'd say I won't necessarily always search for size. I will get to a size where I feel like I've done what I've intended to do and then go back into fasting. So I'll probably eat maybe eight hours a day rather than the full day and then incorporate a lot more fasting, which we still do with the community. We still do four fasts a year. And I think they're most important for the longevity, for the lifespan, to heal anything, issues that may have come up during that time, and to just bring stillness to the body. So yeah, I, I probably like to maintain around about 210, 200 pounds in the future. And I think that will be quite easy as long as I don't allow myself, you know, a seven year deficit without any fitness and obviously reducing calories sometimes to none, 2000 calories a day. Yeah. It's definitely that consistency aspect, isn't it? Like you said, it's far easier to like maintain as well than to build. Yeah, of so, course. So like, yeah. It's, so it must be, obviously you said you're preparing your next meal. It must be quite like a full-time job. Like, yeah, it's a job. Yeah. Or, or like a, you know, it's, it takes a lot of, a lot of like preparation. Do you, do you find like you're able to like travel in this lifestyle or? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. You just have to prepare, you know? Yeah. So when, whenever we traveled, even when we were, uh, uh, fruit based we would make sure that we had everything and for many years we were in our camper van traveling you know from a to b and under the um under the seating area that u-shaped sofa that i created in the in the camper i probably had 300 oranges there's five watermelons <laughs> seven cucumbers 50 avocados 100 tomatoes 20 peppers courgettes uh other types of melons apples it was it was a bus a fruit bus <laughs> sounds like a good bus <laughs> and, <to me. laughs> and we would be consistently eating you know unless we were going through those periods uh, as they up until three years ago four years ago we still had a high volume and then i went on our food you know i probably maintained without training a reasonable 
13 stone, you know, 13 and a half stone. Yeah, still substantial. Yeah. Just a whole, just fruit base without training. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who are like maybe hearing this about this lifestyle, they have a lot of questions and doubts about like maybe a common one I hear is like the cost and things like that. How, how do you find like the cost of the diet and yeah, just logistical side of things? There's always ways to get things cheaper. Mm. And if you've got a will, you'll find a way to get it. And it's usually down the wholesale route. So yeah. when we were having that fruit in our van, I was, whether I was in the UK or Spain, for Spain, for example, I was paying 40 cent per kilo of oranges. So I would buy a hundred mm. kilo of oranges at a time at 40 euro. My tomatoes were around about 10 cent a kilo. Apples maybe 50 cent a kilo. And so I was buying the wholesale. In the UK, you can go to distribution centers where they sell wholesale. Um, and you just have to buy higher volume. But again, if you're eating this level of food, then you need to buy higher volume because it's going to last the week. If you go to the shops and the supermarkets, you're taking a pain tenfold. You know, for the heating, the electric, the staff, and all these different elements. So yeah, it can be expensive, but if you if you've got a will, you'll make a way, and you'll do whatever it takes. But you should never put a price on your health. You know, mm. this is why it's so easy to go the convenience food route because you're just opening something up. But again, I feel you're paying the price for the convenience, not mm. only in your wallet but with your health and life. Exactly. Yeah, I resonate with that message a lot because, like you say, it's so important. You end up paying either way, and like prevention is far better than a cure. Like, yeah, it's it's so true. It's very true. And just, do you, what do you think? It's, obviously, it's like hypothesizing, but like, just say you were fully raw uh, and just fruit. Maybe let's say you're in the tropics. Do you think it's possible to build this level of muscle? Because a lot of people maybe they won't want to be this big because like it's it's a Maybe they want to be, I don't know, let's say like 160, 170 pounds, like lean muscle, things like that. Like myself included, like I'd say maybe 160, 170. Do you feel like that's possible fully raw on fruit? Yeah. Yeah, and, 100%. And, ha and what kind of like strategies would you use for that? Would you do like maybe Yeah. Cool. Just focus on trying to gain, get around about 800 calories per meal, eating five or six times a day minimum. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to acquire that weight. You just have to remember calories, unnecessary calories. It's, it's not really done how it affects the body. It's done in an experiment outside of the body. And I think fruit is very easily digested. So just to make sure that you're observing your body, you know, this is one of the most important things within all life is having the ability to observe and, and make your own science within. And if you're not getting progress or gains, you notice yourself becoming quite flat and, and, and weaker then obviously the food intake needs to come up. You might be overtraining. There's so many different elements to this uh, this type of sport. Um, and usually it just grows over time. But as you said prior to that, it is consistency. If you miss a meal, you know, you can wipe off your progress in, in a week, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very on point with it. Yeah. Yeah, like you say, it's... And I think it's very important having like a goal in mind as well. Like, like you said, well, not like you say, but I've heard you say in the past and it's something that resonates with me because a lot of people, they fixate myself included in the past on like conforming to like ideology, like oh, I want to stay raw or I want to do this. And maybe you, you will feel slightly better on that. I don't know, but it's off. If you have a goal in mind, it may, you use the diet as like a tool. Yeah. Have you, if, yeah. Have you? You think when when we go into this type of lifestyle, we've been very inquisitive about life. Mm -hmm. We kind of are our own researchers. We become very attracted to certain concepts. Hopefully, we try out the concept, we experience it, and we know what it does to our body. We know mm -hmm. where we feel great. We're not just trying one diet and sitting there. We're trying all the different types of diets. We recognize what's for healing. We recognize what's for longevity. For me which is, I wouldn't say it's controversial, but it could be for some people who are very fixated on this lifestyle. When we get our food from the supermarket shops and corporations, we are faced with deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're strictly predominantly fruit-based. We're going to be having to tackle B12 deficiency, iodine deficiency, probably vitamin D deficiency, maybe a slight bit of iron. 
Mm -hmm. And if we just see that each food is grown in specific soils, now this soil might have more cobalt than this soil. It might allow B12 production. This one might have more iron. So you see, if you can have a diverse diet across the broad spectrum for long, when I say longevity, I mean the longevity of a certain diet to maintain your health on a certain diet. It's probably better to be more of a whole food plant-based than just specifically fruit, but a very high fruit. And I would say high fruit until four, maybe until the last meal where you're mm. sleeping and your body can break it down overnight. So then you can still maintain the energy. You can very much live a very happy and healthy long life. Even if we look back to our grandparents, mine are 94, 95. Wow. And they just had a predominantly whole food lifestyle. They do eat meat, they do eat dairy, and they did eat bread. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have all these processed sweets and processed foods to stand there today. They ate a lot from their garden, and they've never been in any deficiency. So mm. 95 is a really great age, a grand age. And if we can see the experimentation and science of our families living to that age and also correlate it possibly with Japan up until 50 years ago, prior to modern day food, they had the longest life expectancy and their diet was a whole food diet. Whether you eat meat or you don't, you can still live a, a very healthily happy life. But when you go to healing, it's totally different. Healing is a totally different way to treat your body and what foods need to be put into your system at that time mm, yeah definitely i'm glad you touched on deficiencies as well because i've had a few like questions about that like in my mind obviously like you said b12 vitamin d iodine things like that what what are your personal like experiences with supplementation deficiencies and yeah what would you recommend for people p12 and d3 are almost always low Mm -hmm. almost always with everyone who I've ever been able to check their blood work, which is, you know, hundreds, if not in thousands. So it's something that needs to be very, very, very much looked at when you shift your diet. Possibly every six months to a year, it's good to get it checked so you can have that underlying knowledge of yourself and the type of foods that you consume and where you're at. Um, but it's not just with fruitarians, vegans, those yeah, two. Sure. I would say are predominantly with everyone and they will need some sort of um, supplementation to go with them. The iodine, iron, I think even sometimes the calcium can be quite low in fruit-based uh, the diets, um, but they're easily rectified, you know, just by making sure you consume a certain type of vegetable daily or just having supplementation for a certain period of time. Um, would allow that to come back to normal and then you can just make sure you're having certain food groups to keep that balance. I've experienced like lower, very lower levels of B12 myself. So, and then I was watching it through supplementation and I found supplementation wasn't really doing what it should, the oral supplementation. Mm -hmm. So I decided to get some hydroxymethylcobalamin shots which just brought me straight back up to the levels that I needed to be at, well, let's say optimal. And then you can just maintain it through oral over time. You know. And how did you feel when you had the low levels and then compared to... Yeah, good something? point. Like the injections, yeah. Tired, like a, a, a tired feeling. But it's very hard to pinpoint because when you're on a raw fruit-based diet, you feel very elevated. You feel very bodily mm. free. And... What really dropped me was fasting. Mm -hmm. So when I promote fasting now, I make sure that everyone has some idea of those four levels within their blood or within their body before they fast. Because when you fast, your levels can be you know, dropped very, very fast and then put you into that yeah. deficiency, which is just so hard to come out of. Hmm. Yeah, so then when you when you supplemented or, or in the injection form, how you, you just noticed like an instant shift? An instant Within like in yourself. four days, you, you notice the energy okay. levels change. And we've helped people who have lost feeling in their arms and legs, you know, complete numbness, have lost motor mm -hmm. skills due to very deficient B12 levels. 
And then I never, never recommend oral supplementation when it's very low. Mm. Within four, four days, three or four days, the numbness has started to go away. And maybe one to two weeks, everything's back up to normal and they feel great again. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. it's different with everyone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, like you said, it's very individualized. But that's, that's interesting because for me, like, maybe the last couple of months I've started supplementing with uh, like methylcobalamin um, from, I think, I think you t- use the same company, British supplements. Yeah. Um, and not that I felt like deficient or like I looked up the symptoms, things like that, but I just thought it was probably precautionary after doing some research, talking to different uh, people with more experience than myself. And yeah, I was just, I'm just curious. Do you feel like if you've, if you've been on, so for me personally, I've been on like a vegan diet, maybe five years, things like that. The last couple of years, uh, like predominantly raw. Do you feel like, when when do you see like deficiencies typically like creep in? Three to five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, especially B12. B12 stored in the liver for a long time. You know, it can be mm-hmm. three, five, even longer. And B12, uh, vitamin D can be stored in the subcutaneous tissue, so the fat cells. So you could just be sort of fighting deficiency off so you're not getting too many symptoms. But, you know, D3 is a precursor to hormones. So all hormone functions come from mm. the primary D3, you know, the conversion of that in themselves. So they're very, very important. Very important. Mm-hmm. And then iodine. I, I know you've talked in the past about iodine. Um, what would you recommend for that? And, and yeah, why is that so deficient in our modern diets? If we look back here, hundred years ago, you know, iodine deficiency was prevalent and they mm-hmm. started to bring in iodine salt. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that salt that was iodized is table salt, which is the worst salt that we can have, you know, mm-hmm. causes many problems, especially high blood pressure and issues with cholesterol because it scratches us internally. And the cholesterol that's built up in the arteries is saving us from that bleeding inside. And cholesterol is the number one most important thing in our body. I'd like to add that. And nobody's ever died of high cholesterol. Only not enough. Only not enough. Mm. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, yeah, just uh, kind of what you're talking about, iodine. So like what? Yeah, iodine, yeah, I was saying. Why, why is it so deficient? And yeah, what would you like recommend? The soil, the, the production of soil that we have, you know, mm-hmm. it's so poor and it's so overused. And they don't let it rest like it used to, to be able to mm-hmm. encourage that bacteria growth to encourage the reproduction of the necessary nutrients there. Um, and iodine, like I said, I think it has been deficient for so long. Um, but what we do to counteract this deficiency, because especially with children that have come into this lifestyle from mums and dads who've previously been eating you know, normal diets, especially supplemented diets, you know, fortified and uh, on table salt and taking eggs and dairy and things like this. Uh, they develop small goiters, which is just an enlargement of the thyroid gland. Mm-hmm. And you'll be able to see it on young children. It's just like a swelling underneath here. And it can it can grow quite large, but it doesn't tend to. And what we do to fix or remedy that is to tell people to buy kombu, which is the highest iodine content semen that there is, and to boil it up and then to use the water uh, and pour them into frozen or freeze them into ice cubes and then take one of them daily. And from children that we've seen with goiters to doing this and, and adults as well, three to four days and goiter starts to subside and then their thyroid is back functioning normal. So it, it's essential, I would say. It's very, very essential. And for us, that's the best way to get it because it also contains other elements mm. that you could be deficient in as well. Definitely. Yeah, because I've heard... Um, some individuals say that just by swimming in the sea we get enough iodine but obviously a lot of us don't even interact with nature that much anymore yeah. so how do you do you feel like that could be the case just like absorption through the skin and things like that I, I feel like it's a nice concept you know but it's very hard to prove so these mm-hmm. things ring around the conscious community spiritual movement and mm-hmm. then a lot of people just hold on to that idea as truth and I've seen this with everything Brother, for the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Everything from healing this, black walnut gets rid of parasites, you need to use MMS for this disease, you get Clodio Silver for this. There are a few things that really genuinely work. 
that really genuinely were. Mm-hmm. And obviously food is the reason why most people are sick. Our body knows what to do with the correct nutrients and it will rebalance over time. When when it's not, one system can be out of play and then other systems can have a, a factor or an issue because of that one system. If you give your body ample nutrients, then the body can take what it needs and flush out what it doesn't. For me, that's the simplest way to remedy 95% of all diseases. Mm. There's no magical herb, there's no magical cure, but there are things that help. Cannabis is one of the herbs that really helps with many, many different diseases and ailments. If somebody's suffering with, let's say, AIDS or a viral infection within the blood, two things I've seen work very well is blood electrification, which is an electric current that goes through the blood that purifies and kills pathogens and parasites, Mm -hmm. and like electromagnetic pulse therapy for those types of diseases. Other than that, Everything else should be able to be remedied by by the food that we intake. Mm. For sure, yeah, it's interesting you say that about like the electromagnetic therapy and things like that. Because in the past, I've I have looked into more. I guess now, like the terms are like biohacking and things like that. Yeah, but yeah. What what would you say? Are like actual, obviously, you said those two. But what would you say are like any useful biohacks? Are there any things like that in your personal life you've benefited from? Maybe like blue light blockers or things like that. Yeah. I mean, for me, biohack just means like a bio- biology hack for the body, chemistry. Mm-hmm. Your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, getting them into alignment, not living life in a reactive state, in a fight or flight, causing yourself an, a day full of illusions with incredible amounts of cortisol and adrenaline and all these stress hormones mm-hmm. being released. That's a biohack. But you have to understand the mental aspect of yourself, the psychology, the mind. And then you have to be able to sit with that and then contemplate and consciously rewrite this subconscious program until it changes. And then as you're doing this process to be able to learn the art of attention, to be able to shift it away from mind and ego into a present state Mm. where you can recognize the freedom and how the mind is actually separate from you, but it arises within you. And then you don't start to identify with it so much and you begin your journey on liberation that's that's the key to the other half of the health for normal bio, biohacks is in something you can implement physically fasting is number one mm-hmm. it, you can watch your skin change within a matter of days you see the hydration you see wrinkles tend to dissolve and disappear and I'd say having that incremented throughout the year like we do four times a year on the solstice and equinoxes is the number one biohack Eating a high, if if not only raw diet, is another biohack. I mean, your body doesn't take any sort of stress to that. And when we look at acidic form in foods, what we have to do is understand the relationship between the breakdown of foods within our system. Mm. And the more difficult it is to break down, the more acidic processes there are within the body to break that down. So the foods itself, by nature, might be acidic, but when the body breaks them down, such as lemons, it's very alkalizing to the system. It causes no resistance. With raw food, there's less resistance. When we say raw food and we experiment and experience with raw food, fruits are supposed to be eaten raw. Vegetables, not so much. For me, when you get to a certain level of freedom stillness within the body and you interact with these food groups you can tell you know so i would say certain vegetables need to be steamed for best absorption Uh, other than that they can cause some irritation issues within the body and they can sometimes deplete minerals from it Mm -hmm. but you're taking out the enzymes through that cooking process that deplete the minerals from you and you're making them better available and more absorbed for your body I wouldn't go as far as saying vegetables are trying to kill you like some of these other influences. Mm. You have to not believe anyone and understand that knowing comes only from your own experience. Belief comes from ideas that you haven't experienced and those beliefs continue to magnify the questions within you. And you'll never find peace from them. So it's paramount that someone acquires wisdom 
through taking the necessary steps within their own experience to know. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. The journey is what's important. And to know is to find liberation. It really is. That's why the word now is in the word no. And you reverse the word no, and it says one. One is related to winning and also oneness. So we're looking to win by removing ourselves from this, this dualistic nature of mind. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's very profound. It's it's also like, I do love how you touch on like the etymology and like the meaning of words and things like that, because even in the word fruit, like I love how you explain that. Could you just touch on that quickly? Why fruit is like our food source? Yeah. Phonetics is uh, how our language is built. You know, history, and we use the word history as his story is told how it wants to be told, but the phonetic alphabet was created by the Phoenicians. And this these Phoenicians created deaf Phoenicians for those who were mm. deaf to the phonetic. So they were called deaf Phoenicians. So they couldn't hear the meaning of the sound through the words, so they created subcontexts where they would give meanings. Now, you and I both know that in mathematics, meaning means average. Mm -hmm. The mean is average. So the meaning is what the average perceive it to be. But beyond the meaning within the word, it has constructed to such a way where if you can see it and understand it, you will have the true meaning of the word. When one can observe words and then down to the individual letter, you'll see that the language and symbolism within our alphabet is it's like an electromagnetic a language and it's through symbols and signs so it's profound mm. words have many hidden meanings but just for example if we look at the word significance this is it makes people tick when they when they see the word significance if anyone can write it down i would try and do it for you quickly and i'm sure most of you have crossed it with my work before but it's the sign if I can see. Mm -hmm. C is this phonetic, so it doesn't matter how it's spelt, it's how it sounds. So the significance of something, there are signs there, but you have to be able to see them. Just as it just as an example, measurement is me assure, that's how it's spelt, me assure meant, which is Latin for mind. mind. So to measure something is to have a sure mind. So it's within the word. And then we have the phonetic sounding of words, which you could use Ambulance, sorry, ambalance. And obviously, of course, they're coming to bring balance because within our universe, balance is the key to all things. Mm. Mental balance, physical balance, spiritual balance. It's not about being pulled one side or the other side. It's about being here centered at all times. That's why the word center is see, enter, because you see and enter that state. Mm. Yeah, and just with the word fruit, what's ah, that was yeah. it, my brother? Yeah, no, no, I love, I love where you for, took it. But... For you, it it's like when we look at the word amino acids, it's amino acid, and these do not produce acids within the body. So, if you look at the dynamics of the word fruit, it's for you, it it's for you, and sitting with logic, as you said, you're a very logical man. We've been told in history that we used to try and find our food. We used to hunt it down. Which I'm sure was the case in barren lands such as the UK prior to habitation. But when we lived around the central zone, the equator that equates continually and it has a perfect environment for the reciprocation of food, fruit, you would have... Number one, the definition of a fruit is bearing a seed, seed bearer. Those seeds you would eat with the fruit, it would go through the digestive tract and it would come out in your feces. Your feces would hopefully go into the soil and that would fertilize the soil and of course allow the seeds to bear fruit themselves. So one apple seed, which says five or six in an apple, can give you an apple tree and an apple tree can give you three to five hundred apples. This is abundance. This is 
logically the way that mankind was supposed to eat. And it's the only thing on the planet which doesn't need you to interact with it to get the fruit. It will drop itself when it's ripe. Other than that, all foods need to be handled by man, cut from the ground, dug up from the roots, which we could say are secondary types of food. But there are thousands of fruits on the planet, on the plane, however you want to interpret your reality. And we haven't got access to them all. But I'm sure as we progress into the future, as consciousness is expanding, mm. we're going to see a very grand business of creating all the original fruits in abundance. Mm. There's sure. even... Uh, you would say theories, but almost facts because they've been documented is when you bite or you have the seed go through your your system, whatever's deficient within your body, it will try to encourage more production of that through the soil. So when you again eat the next fruit from that, it would help in your system as well. So there's a wonderful relationship between your food and yourself. A hundred percent. And just talking about like bringing back older fruits and maybe like more tropical th fruits and things like that. How do you feel about like tropical fruit nutrition compared to like where we live, obviously in the UK? How do you feel yeah. like, is that why we're deficient because we're not eating these tropical fruits? Yeah, again, but if the tropical fruits are in a mainstream production, they're going to be limited to what they can you know, give us mm -hmm. as well. But wild fruits themselves, yeah, of course, they tend to be a lot bigger in the tropics, like a durian, jackfruit, um, sour sap, coconut, for example, they're all big and they're all high in dense in calories. So number one, the calories you get from tropical fruit tend to be a lot higher than the fruits we see predominantly here, mm -hmm. especially if we are not getting imported food. food. Because number one, I think bananas are probably the number one fruit in the UK, again, which is a tropical fruit, and that is high in calories itself. You know, just a kilogram of banana is... 900 calories. Mm. I want you to see how the kilogram of apples, you know, you're talking 180 calories, maybe. Mm. Maybe 200, something like that. Yeah, it's very low, whatever it is. Yeah, so tropical fruits tend to be a lot more denser in calories, and I would say also a lot more dense in nutrition as well. Mm. And how do you feel about dried fruit? Because obviously here in the UK, we don't sometimes, like for me personally, when I was in Spain, I, I didn't include dried fruit in my diet. But now I tend to like soak dates and then blend them into like a smoothie or something like that. How, yeah. do, you, how do you feel about dried fruits? Dried fruit and rehydrated fruit, I'd say is very different. The only thing with, with dried fruit, it can cause heartburn and a bit of acid if you over consume them. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're hydrating them, the body can, you know, easily assimilate them without causing any issues. So it's just something to look at. If you find yourself having heartburn with dried fruit, then you know, rehydrate them or eat less. Other than that, it's going to be far superior to having anything else, you know, any other type of quick, convenient food. Mm -hmm. um, it's also bringing you diversity. Dates are very high powerhouses of energy. You know, they got great vitamins in them, but also they got great sugar density. So they provide a lot of nutrition and energy. So I think it's important to get that diversity, especially after going through so many years of, uh, like, fruitarianism. Mm-hmm. And then observing blood work through that time, I just think now diversity for all of us is just key. Mm. It really is. Yeah, definitely. And do you think that's why people may be more prone to deficiencies if they have like a lack of diversity in their diet? Now, especially now, yeah. yeah because yeah, like now, I said, yeah. the lack of diversity means we're visiting one, one or two farmers, you know, mm. maybe three. Their souls, who knows what's inside of them. Probably the three MPK, you know, nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, maybe some magnesium. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's just so important, the diversity, which brings us on to, you know, the salt aspect of things, because people in our communities uh, come across so much information that's quite negative towards salt, and they have so many questions about it. Should I have it? Should I not? Mm. And I think, you know, this is what makes it so difficult for someone who's looking for truth. Mm. The truth, you know, we're told is out there, but it's not. It's really within you. If you fancy salt, you know, and you feel like it's benefiting you, 
you should have salt, you know, and salt contains between, depending on the salt, 72 and 93 minerals, which are essential for bodily function. When we're eating food that's deficient in these minerals, it's like the best supplement we can have. Mm. Yeah. Fruit itself doesn't taste nice with salt on it. But when you start to cook food and you start to implement vegetables, it starts to bring sort of balance to these foods, which I feel utilizing your senses is a very obvious thing that is necessary because there's a depletion of the minerals in them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so salt itself, I would say the only salt that's banned for you really is going to be the table salt because it's primarily plastic, microplastics, bit of sand, maybe a bit of glass mixed up in there mm-hmm. and uh, highly sodium fied. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just sodium chloride isn't it it's just yeah so the, I, i'm fascinated with the salt because that's something i've recently started like incorporating um we have like pink himalayan salt here but i've also heard people say about celtic or celtic however you want to say it, uh sea salt and things like that is there any particular one you'd recommend i use i use himalayan um and i have used celtic in the past the, the the theories around Celtic salt is it has slightly more mineral density, maybe 10 more minerals than Himalayan. Some facts say Himalayan has more, 93. Some mm-hmm. say it has 72. Some say Celtic salt has 83. But the idea behind the Celtic salt, um, I think what it comes down to is hydration. Mm. When, you, when you put salt into the body, for example, prior to hydrating, just a, a small grain, what it does is it creates a, a reaction in the body that then allows the cells to open to pull in water so it can aid in hydration. You know, we have, if you look into Ayurvedic um, medicine, food systems, they say never drink during your meal. Always drink prior to the meal or at least like an hour after your meal because you're diluting the gut to be able to absorb the food. But the thing is, when we eat food, we find ourselves getting thirsty during the consumption of food because we've opened up the cells to be able to absorb water. And from the cooked water, sorry, the cooked food, it doesn't seem to be very high in water content. So it's good throughout the day if you if you want to test this out. If you feel sometimes you're not very hydrated and you do consume a lot of water, but it comes straight out of you, it's just to put a grain of salt under the tongue and then leave it a minute or two and, and have a couple of glasses or just half a glass of water to, to, to during that time. And you'll see that your body tends to hydrate a lot better. So salt itself gives the capacity for greater hydration, even though we're told it causes dehydration mm-hmm. because what we see... From scientific examples, you put it on a slug, it dries it out, and we think it's doing it in our body, but it's a totally different process. Mm, for sure, because there's a lot of dogma and fear around salt, especially in like the raw vegan community. But I know like you say, yeah, and uh, it's a shame because we've come from a space and a world full of processed foods, and you know, even though the processed foods have got so much worse in the last mm. 10, 15 years, and people eat them in so much more volume, it's brought this fear around all the things that's kept us healthy for so many years, you know? And I say, if you're not having processed foods, you don't ever buy anything out of a bottle, you're doing all right. For sure. For your health. For sure. mm-hmm. Yeah. I just got a couple more questions on diet, and then, then yeah, we'll, no. we'll begin to wrap up, because I'm getting conscious of time. And there's a few rapid fire questions I'd like to ask you at the end as well. Give it, we got another 15. Cool. Okay. okay, cool. Perfect. That should be enough. Um, yeah. So just about the water, when you send about water, what water would you recommend personally or from experience? Uh, I've, I've always become uh, fond of distilled water just because of its purity. Mm-hmm. I like to make sure my water is restructured. So when I do consume my water, it's usually stored in a vessel of copper, um, only for a short period of time, maybe an hour or two. And then as I pour into a glass, I try to make a vortex with it, and I will utilize the power of a silver spoon and create this uh, vortex within it just to restructure it, because it allows the, 
the structure to align with its natural perfection, which then is open to optimal hydration within the body. Um, it does serve me. Mm. Other water systems, um, they they can be good as well, you know, like reverse osmosis and things like this. But for me, adding a small amount of salt back into the distilled water to make sure it has the balance of electrolytes or even utilizing, I posted on our website recently, um, you just type in uh, water and it will come up uh, with a certain perfect uh, balance of calcium, magnesium and potassium, which gives you, I'd say, the ultimate hydration, which is basically exactly the same as a coconut ratio. Ah, okay, like coconut water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's interesting because... Yeah, I'd be curious to to look into that because because sometimes um, I'm not sure the exact make, but here at home we have like a it's got like a multi stage filter. It's like some sort of big thing. I think it's called like invigorated water or something like that. Now, for me personally, if I just drink that on its own without like lemon juice or salt prior to it, I don't feel like it really hydrates me. Like you say, like is that just because it? Yeah, why why would that be? Just because it's not like structured and living. yeah yeah uh, water needs to be moving you know in its natural mm. state flowing because that's what keeps it almost healthy you know it's like a breathing water and it's usually just due to the mediation of different levels of temperature with inside the water itself so it rolls upon itself check out Victor Schauberger's works so that'll give you a good in-depth knowledge of how water actually works and vortices um and if it's not aligned properly, it doesn't hydrate the cells. If there's no salts inside them, it won't hydrate the cells properly. So it tends to just come through the body and go out. And if you find yourself urinating a lot when you drink a lot of water, it's definitely uh, time to just look into your water and see if there's any sort of areas that you can improve or test, uh, observe and repeat for your own science. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so your water is it's just a like a, a multi-stage filter and then what comes out the bottom is what you drink yeah yeah it definitely yeah. tastes a lot purer and cleaner because compared to tap water because when it begins to yeah. run out i know it's like a big t a difference in taste um but yeah it's just they say i think there's different like rocks or things inside the filter or to, yeah. to supposedly filter it but I, i'm not sure how good it is but it's probably rock sand and some carbon yeah it's like a multi charcoal bomb yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's really good you know? and nature nature has its ways of um purifying water for us you know but then you have to really open yourself up to inner contemplation because we draw us our water from underground aquifers mm -hmm. the water tends to go through different sediments of the earth picking up you know a lot of essential nutrients mm -hmm. you know our water could and should really contain b12 because the cobalt and the soil and the bacteria that it's mixing with should be creating this perfect synergy for us and i think one of the reasons why we don't have uh b12 in our diet is because we we don't drink this water but mm. tap water in itself is not essentially purified water but it's cleaned water through processes of alchemy or chemical infusions mm, definitely and with, with b12 um people say obviously we interact with it with dirt soil things like that it's just naturally occurring in other forms how much of that would we actually absorb? Like, do you reckon? In, do you, would that, would that be enough to pull us out of like things? Yeah, like deficiencies or something like that. If we were to have like non-treated water from the earth. Yeah, they just say like there's traces of it everywhere in like nature and things like that, just by interacting with the yeah, going back to more natural roots. But do you feel it's like that's so hard adequate? to say? Yeah, it's so hard to say because one, we clean our hands you know, all the time. If we didn't clean our hands and we were eating out, I'm sure you're going to be getting ample. But we look into the uh, the monkey kingdom, the gorilla, they, they sometimes eat their own feces. And mm. that's where they're getting their B12 from. Mm. You know, so it's very hard to say, but it's organic and it's from the soil. So it should be ever present within soil. Mm. It, it, all it needs is a cobalt rich soil. And the bacteria feeds off it and produces B12. Ancient mm. cultures used to grab a little bit of um, soil and put it inside the food that they were making. 
I'm sure for the very same reason. Mm, definitely. Yeah, because my mum has recently started, last couple of years, started growing like greens and potatoes and things like that. And I, when I'm washing them, I try not to like obsessively like clean off every bit of dirt. And Yeah, mm. so I guess how how would we know is there any way of knowing if, it, if it's rich in cobalt or would you have to like actually test the soil yeah you'd, you'd have to test it for sure and again yeah. in our local areas and in, in the places that we've been hab, had our habitation um the soil isn't necessarily a fertile land mm. if you if you try and put just a tomato seed in your ground outside in your property without making it a good function soil system it more than likely won't grow mm. So it's it's really difficult to to give some sort of direct good knowledge on that. So it's best to just keep a good check on your blood work. And and then when we look at the other side, the flip side, what food you're growing with, uh, and a lot of food is collect poo or feces is collected from local governments and sprayed upon farmers' fields. And then there's so much different bacteria and illnesses and sickness and bugs and viruses that exist there so if you don't wash your food properly then raw food can give you stomach bugs not just uncooked meat because of those farming practices it's just sprayed on top of the land it's not dug underneath you know like it was when we used to poo into the ground mm. so there's just so many things that you have to be very aware and conscious of so i think cleaning food is paramount if it's in your garden you know what's in it essentially it's not sprayed with sludge so you're going to be okay but when you said that i just wanted to point out when you get your lettuce or your salad from the shops make sure you wash it properly mm -hmm. vinegar and sodium bicarbonate to kill off any type of bacteria or virus that could be on there 100 percent. yeah yeah just just quickly i don't think what was the name of the guy with the water and the uh, Victor, uh, Victor Sch Schauberger? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, just because so, I know people will probably ask. Um, yeah, yeah. And I just just got a couple more on diet, real quick. So just about like spices and chili, onion, garlic. Um, how, how do you feel about them? And yeah, because they're often promoted as like health foods. Yeah, I think it's very strange how they're promoted as health food because if one is healthy and doesn't eat them and tries to eat them. They will feel absolutely ill, rotten, mm. flu-like. Um, garlic is a known poison. If you get it into the bloodstream, it's very dangerous. If you get it into a cut, you'll feel the ramifications of the garlic. I think this is why it's so important to go through a, a period of abstinence, abstaining from these food groups. They're nervous system stimulants. So they become very addictive. You tend to crave them. But what happens is when they stimulate the nervous system so much, they can also kill the neurons as well. So you're creating less of a vibratory connection with the neurons. If you have chili, for example, what's the first thing you notice at the back of your throat? It's like intense amounts of mucus. Yeah. Yeah. Like real thick saliva starts to form mm, a lot yeah. of mucus. So what the reverse world of science has done, it says this helps with your immune system. What it does is it triggers the immune system because the body doesn't want it inside of it. But science says this is good for the immune system because it's activating the immune system. Mm -hmm. Almost like a vaccine, yeah. you know. Yeah. They yeah. say they create the immune system to be stronger, but really you're just practicing fighting that virus off anyway. And if you just waited to have it, it doesn't make mm -hmm. sense. Plus, again, all of the other elements that's inside of them that are not very good for the body. So I'd say it's the very same thing. Onions are probably the best out of all of those food groups. They can be mm. tolerated. When they're raw, they can be quite toxic, but cooked, they tend to convert and be quite quite sweet, you know. So if you had to have any of the three to keep your food flavorsome, go with the onion, but still they're all nervous system stimulants. And what goes up must come down. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. And I guess the same could be said for caffeine and oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> cacao. That's also a stimulant, isn't it? Are there any other yeah. you can think of that are like... Promoted? Well, we moved, we moved to carob for our yeah. chocolate flavor. Mm -hmm. And you don't notice any different. Mm. You know, you might in the first week or two, 
but you don't notice any different. And also, where where carob is, uh, it's a sugar. It's not a fat. You'll notice that when you mix sugars and fats, you can spike insulin, and and then fat can be pushed to the cells, so you can actually acquire a certain amount of body fat. When you're having like, dates and carob together to make that chocolate flavor, you're just having the sugar, which you're not putting it sugar. You're having the natural sugar, which the body wants. It's your primary source of fuel. Without the fat, so you won't get fat as such. So you can eat more of that than you would if you added in the the uh, cacao. Definitely, yeah. Because a lot of people fear sugar. Like, why? Why is it that fruit sugar is different? Just quickly, because I know a lot of family members. Like, for example, there's family members with like type two diabetes, and they say they have to watch their blood sugar because of, fr- uh, yeah, fruit. They've got to watch their fruit because of their blood sugar. So, what would you say to that? I say. It's what's going to heal your diabetes. Mm -hmm. But when you're first trying to bring yourself away from type 2 diabetes, it's important to remove all the fats because it's the fats which are actually the problem. Mm. And then start interacting with some vegetables and then start moving into like raw and more fruits and you'll see that your blood sugar is cleaned up, is absolutely balanced now and you no longer have the the diabetes that you were once labelled with, um, is, but sugar itself. I mean, we label sugar and we talk about sugar as if it's all the same. Um, we look at studies done with sugar on the body, and it's always done with high fructose corn syrup. And high fructose corn syrup, one is toxic, more than likely is GMO. Where it's taken out of its natural state, the body doesn't recognise it. It sees it as something foreign. It struggles to break it down. This process is acidic. Acidity is the seat of disease. So the metabolic uh, processes start to come out of balance. And this is labeled sugar is bad. Our body's primary source of fuel is sugar, glucose, and fructose. So Mm -hmm. our body wants it in the most easily assimilated way which is why fruit is optimal food for us. And anybody who says it makes me feel bad has done it for five days or less, or they're just at the start of their journey and they're going through detox, but the body now has the right amount of fuel and energy to be able to start dealing with all the toxins that's been within the body, you know, and you're not putting them in, so they have to come out. I ask, I challenge anyone who is not sure about food systems to just go through a transitional diet, which is what I did, but I did them for six months at a time. So take yourself off processed foods, eat whole food, just eat any food in its holistic form, eat it. Learn to become a, a master of your craft during that time how to implement certain flavors with others, become a great chef. I mean, this is this is a very small but one element that most people have no mastery over within themselves. They have no idea how to put food together. Mm. So it's all a part of this process. Then take out the meat, see how you feel. And then start to remove the cooked food or maybe just have raw food until four o'clock. Have one cooked dinner. And when you've done this for a certain period of time, you will notice how you feel. And it's how you feel that's going to inspire you. See and inspire you to keep pushing through and trying try new systems out. Then go to fully raw, then move to fruit, then try some juice fasting, give yourself a water fast, and then reverse that. So go back to the juice, go back to the fruit, go back to the raw, go back to the cooked one meal a day, and then go back to just whole food. Through that time of doing this, if you did it for six months or a year, you're going to learn how to be your own doctor. You're going to see what clears up within you. You're going to have a relationship with your food in a different way. You're going to know why you feel ill. You're going to know the outcome of the foods that you eat. It's going to make you feel a certain way. And then forevermore, you've got the wisdom that's carried with you. So no matter what ailment you have, what issues arisen, you can bring a diagnosis to remedy and cure. And I'd say that's, that is so important for each and every one of us on our journey looking for truth. Because you can sit 
on a whole food diet or a whole food plant-based diet and be perfectly healthy and happy. Mm. But you can't heal necessarily all the ailments that are out there on that diet. Many will clear up. But those transitions you'll know and you'll be able to share with others along your way. And if it's not healing, tackle the mentality, tackle the mind. It's really important to liberate yourself from the mental suffering that exists in 99.9% .9 of the population. Past and future context, you know, fear, anxiety, depression, doubt, uncertainty. All of these things that keep us locked into our mind. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. It's like you read my mind because <laughs> I was going to ask you about tip, tips to transition. So I think that's quite useful for anyone who's thinking about embarking on like a health journey because it can often seem a bit overwhelming at first. Yeah, I, the yeah. question skipped in time a bit, brother. What was the first question in time? Uh, to be honest, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't fully remember. I think it was just, oh, it was about diabetes and fruit sugar, actually. Oh uh, no! Yeah, after, did you yeah. not just ask the question then? Did you not just answer uh, the question? No, there was no, a little bit of kind skip. Of, you, you kind of answered it. To be fair, I was just going to ask okay. you about um, how how can someone transition? But you you, you yeah. covered it quite eloquently there. And first of all, just the thing that really will give you the push is learn about the foods that you're consuming. Mm the processed foods, understand how bad they are for the body. Mm -hmm. And that will give you enough to try to make a change. If you don't understand that like MSG is causing issues with headaches and many other problems, you know, being an excited toxin that overstimulates the mind and also kills off brain cells at the same time when it just tastes like salt. But people invented it because they don't want to give you salt because low salt or sodium salt that is for iodine deficient population uh, has, has been proven to be bad and called high blood sugar, you could just switch to Celtic salt and have more of it mm -hmm. and still be happy and healthy without the headaches and without the other issues in the met with the metabolic system. Um, it's so easy to make the simple changes, you know, it really is. Instead of using sugar, you could just start using dates or even honey, you know. And instead of making a bowl of crisps with six different packets, just get some potatoes, slice them thinly, put your oven up to like 190 degrees, cover them in smoked paprika or salt, however you want to do it. Lay them on a tray. 20 minutes, you've got yourself some crisps. It's just about being diligent, you know, making, if you like chips, stop using oil, stop frying with oil, start frying with water. Just put your chips in the oven, 200 degrees, 40 minutes. They're crispy, sweet. Just got to choose the right potato because there's different types of potato that create, you know, mashed potato better than chips, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole world of information is available to everyone. Um, on so many different levels just when you make these changes and I think just having a certain level of mastery over each element is important for a healthy happy life mm -hmm. and it brings a sense of achievement so you do get the gratification from from the outcome I think and as you said earlier goals goals are important to set along the journey but to also know that goals take you away slightly from the present moment mm -hmm. you know the desire to have something or to do something can separate you really from peace mm. so it's trying to know where you want to be but enjoy the process as it happens because even having a desire to have no desire causes you suffering mm. yeah, it's a wonderful true. journey and if food is your journey at the moment it's a gateway to higher truths for sure 100 mm. 100 just quickly I would have ended with that, but I've just realized that I didn't really ask you too much about your training. Just very, very quickly. How many times a week yeah. do you train? Six to seven. Mm -hmm. And, what, and what my kind of off days, like? my off days are usually like my calf. So I, I pretty much go every day. So at the moment I will do um, chest and triceps together, mm -hmm. back and then biceps. Mm -hmm. Then I will do calves, rear delts, and side delts, mm -hmm. and legs. And then I will repeat. 
Mm -hmm. If I still feel slightly sore on the tricep or the chest, I will obviously have a day off. But it tends to be a perfect split for me. So everything gets trained twice in eight days. Mm -hmm. And you've noticed your recovery on this lifestyle is like... Oh, so oh, different, yeah. yeah. Than it would have been, yeah. And I think a lot of people do. A lot of people do. Um, but it has to be tried, tested, and repeated, and observed to know. Mm -hmm. For sure. And yeah, I just, I just like to finish with like, if there's anyone who's like in a low point in their life, if if you could like speak directly to them, what kind of advice would you give them? Like, if yeah, just low low point in your life is usually you've created a hyper fixated focus and you give so much attention to all the negativity in life. Mm. All it takes is a shift in perception. And I think gratitude is the most important thing we can find there. Instead of focusing on negativity, let's try to consciously focus on positivity. Not what you haven't got, but what you do have. And it's just mm. that switch in mindset that starts to bring and cultivate joy with inside yourself. Essentially, you are the master and the creator of your own reality at any given moment. And it is through your perception. And the awareness of perception grows and expands with experience. For me, contemplation has always been the most powerful tool. So trying to understand why I feel or felt a certain way prior to being free was the most important thing. And you'll see that mostly every cause of your suffering is a desire to change what is, what was, or what might be. You resent yourself for not taking actions in the past that you believe you should have. You fear tomorrow because you don't know how it will be. That's depression and anxiety, yet you never touch or experience the grace of the present moment, which is free from judgment, which is just the experience and the only experience you will ever have. Anything else other than here and now is an illusion. It's a mental construct it's within one's own imagination. This is why the saying time doesn't exist is real because you never get to experience time. All you have is this moment. Mm. Past and future ex is experienced in this moment as imagination. So... Let's not feed into the trail of the past or feed into the idea of the future. Let's ground ourselves in this moment. And when we're here, if we find ourselves suffering or stuck in thought, let's just focus on the positivity. Focus on what you've got. Mm. Focus on who you have. And that will change the very way you see life. 100%. Definitely. I think that's a great way to end. And just... Just quickly, where can people find you? Like, what have you got going on? Like, where would you like to yeah, send them? Okay. Um, YouTube channel is Josh X. I have a wonderful community and a website, xfamunity.com. We have incredible courses helping with mental health. It's called the Virtue Course. It helps you understand your personality, your persona, the traits that cause suffering. Very great key into the to the freedom that most people are looking for. We have yoga, we have posture, we have fitness course on there, which can be utilized for home workouts from beginner to advanced. Also in gym workouts from beginner to very advanced with all the different types of mechanisms in there that can help you progress and understand fitness more. And then we have fasting information, healing information, diets, recipes, and so much more. So it would be wonderful to have you if you ever want to join anyone. So, yeah. And our, our Instagram, which is not so much used, but it has sources and information, is X Family Unity or at X Family Unity. And you'll find our work there too. Perfect. I'll put all the links in the description. Obviously. Thank you. And yeah. I appreciate your time, brother. Yeah. It's really lovely to speak with you again, spend some time. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, I appreciate everyone listening. If you've listened this far, have a great day. Yeah. Peace and love. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone.